Good to have you out this morning. What a blessing we hear on a rooftop this morning. We needed this rain. God is blessing this morning. God is, should be blessing in each and every one of our hearts if we allow Him to do that. We have an opportunity this day to see what blessings God has for us by coming to His house and worshiping our Heavenly Father this morning. Peggy Lou. Good morning. Good Welcome morning. to Bethel. Thank you. <laughs> well, <laughs> Welcome to Bethel Baptist. Uh, join us tonight at 5 o'clock on Facebook Live as we uh, study the life of David. Wednesday, come back to church here at 7 o'clock and join us for prayer meeting. Have a short devotional, devotional and have the opportunity to spend time in prayer with other believers. Next Sunday morning, come at 9.15 for Sunday School. We are uh, going through the book of Genesis, and you are missing a blessing if you're not here. Looking ahead, November 17th will be our Thanksgiving Fellowship Dinner. There is a sign-up sheet on the door back in the foyer, so look at that. Operation Christmas Child. Um, there may be some red and green shoeboxes back in the in the foyer for Operation Christmas Child. Um, you can take one of the boxes and fill it up with uh, toys and uh, personal items and things for kids who normally would not get a Christmas gift. And if you got one of those boxes, please return it no later than November 20th so it can um, get taken care of and shipped out. Amen. It's good to be in God's house this morning. We can worship and we can praise our Heavenly Father for who He is this morning. Amen. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the opportunity we have this morning to gather together as a body. Thank you for the opportunity we have to come apart from our daily activities, the hustle and bustle and the things that are going on. Come to your house knowing that we can sit under your word. As the word is opened up, Father, we ask that you cause each and every one of us inwardly to be determined to open our hearts up. Yes, to accept what you have for us this morning. We come to this house this morning knowing that you have something for each and every one of us. We shall now come to the end of the service and leave and not know that God's spoken. We need to be open to your word. You will do that. You will minister. You will give direction. You will give strength for the up and coming things coming up this coming week that we're unaware of. Cause us to be attentive to your word this morning. We think of those that uh, are not with us this morning that uh, would love to be. We think of Edie this morning. Continue to pray for healing. Mm -hmm. Continue to pray that gain of strength and that you will uh, have her up on her feet uh, very quickly. Guide and direct there. We think of others that are dealing with uh, some things that we may not even realize this morning. You know the hearts of each and every one in our congregation. I ask that you would just minister to each one. Guide and direct will give you the praise and the glory for it all this morning. Amen. Amen. I am looking at hymn number one. My wife says she hopes that I can find it. <laughs> That's confidence. Stand with me, please. Hymn number one. Joyful, joyful, we adore that. <laughs>
to 203. And can it be? she's thinking she knows exactly what I'm thinking and it comes in very handy <laughs> we're looking at 
attention to what it says. That's what it's all about this morning. We're going to be in front of the Lord's table. Calvary covers it all. Number two. The stripes that he bore and the thorns that he wore told his mercy and love ever serious I gotta mention to you you realize that <coughs> Carol and Peg are celebrating their 40th anniversary today Good for you. is that a blessing or what and um, all joking aside I'm not gonna you know that's something that's exciting that is thrilled this thrilling to see um, we live in a world where we don't have time for each other uh, to me, that's a real blessing. You're almost praying. <laughs> yeah. um, I might mention in the boxes for Operation Christmas Child, they cannot have anything that's liquid in that box. They're being shipped overseas, and so they can't. But um, I, I was looking at the store the other day, and I'm probably going to buy a couple of soccer, soccer balls. You deflate them, and you put a pump in there. And, um, or basketballs. I'm not sure what country it's going to. Basketball is a pretty good sport around the world, too. But I know soccer, what they call football, is a pretty good sport. These go to countries that are closed to missions. And they send a, a message to the children that would not get a Christmas any other way. And so I'd encourage you, and I can, we've got four boxes in the um, uh, fellowship hall um, that we're kind of starting to fill up a little at a time. But if you want to grab one of those, you're sure welcome. There's one in the foyer. So take that to heart. You ever think about how wonderful it is to know Jesus? Mm. 
The prophets are often seen, in fact, I'm just finishing in my yearly Bible reading, reading through the minor prophets, and the prophets are often seen by many of us as an old man with a long gray beard, no comments now, and shaking his finger in people's face saying, you better straighten up or else. And I almost had that picture of Isaiah in many ways, but Isaiah is a picture of the gospel. And then I come to Isaiah 55. I'll tell you, studying this week, see, I get a couple blessings being a pastor and preaching. I get the blessing of spending the week in this passage of the Word of God. And this week, I, I felt like I was going to jump out of my skin. So excited about what it means to be saved. What it means to know Jesus. What it means to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. And I'll tell you, it gets exciting when you think of what you've got in Christ. And I'd ask you to turn your copy of the Word in Isaiah 55. If you remember, we left off last week where we were told there's a time limit to God's salvation. There's a time limit to salvation. And then we get to verse 8. And the Word of God in Isaiah 55, verse 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So my word will be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing which I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come the cypress tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Father. Teach us your word. Help us to be excited about your word. Help us to be thrilled about what's happening in our lives and what's happening with you. We'll give you the praise and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You come to Isaiah 55 and you realize that the first step here to receiving God's blessing is surrendering your thoughts. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways or your ways are not my ways. And I think about it. And when I have a difficulty in life and I have a failure in life with God, I realize part of it is that my mind is not right. My thought life is not right. I spend hours in front of a media, in front of social media, and you know it affects the way you think. And very little time in the Word of God and it affects the way I think. And we really need to think about how we think. And as you look at this passage, it is especially regarding salvation. Our thoughts differ from the Lord's. There are times when I look at the Word, and I look at what God's doing in our lives, and in my life in particular, and I wonder, what are you thinking, Lord? What do you have in mind with that? In Sunday school this morning, we looked at Joseph and how he had been betrayed again and again. And you had to be thinking in Joseph's mind, what are you thinking, God? What is going through your mind? God's ways are not my ways. Amen? Amen? I'm glad that God does things differently than I do. That God says, my thoughts are like the mountains above the plains. Mountains are wonderful. They're beautiful to look at. Climbing mountains... It's not quite so easy. I think of those pioneers who crossed the, the Great Divide, and I think, man, every day they're climbing that mountain, and every day it was harder and harder and harder, and I realized that's kind of like my thought life and my ways. God's ways are a lot higher than mine. 
God has a lot more going on than I can even imagine. And this is written to an arrogant people who thought that they knew better than God and thought that they could work their way to heaven. In fact, this passage directly affects our thoughts about eternal life and our thoughts about salvation. You know, there's a great mystery here when you think about salvation because it's not the way I would do it. I, everything in my life is geared toward works. You ever notice that? If you work hard, you get a benefit of working hard. And there's nothing free. You got to earn what you, what you make and you got to earn what you keep. We have that thought in our mind, don't we? And we realize that oftentimes our hard work gives us benefits. But then we come to this issue of salvation. And it goes completely against our grain. Most religions teach that you work your way to heaven. Most religions teach that you have this list that you got to keep and you check it off. Okay, I made it to church today. Got that one. I, I, I was nice to somebody today. Got that one. I bought the pastor a coffee today. Got that. No, that's not there. But we, we think somehow that we've got this list that we've got to check off and there are all kinds of religions that are built on that. And they have their list. There's some, I've heard there are some churches where they have a, a list of how many hours you knocked on doors. And somehow you're going to earn your way to heaven by knocking on all these doors and that. And then I look at what the Word of God teaches about salvation. And it goes directly against everything that I think is right. See, I think I've got to earn my way to heaven. And the Bible tells us it's already been paid for. The gospel message is the fact that Jesus died in our place for our sins on the cross. He was buried and he rose again. And when I accept the fact that Jesus died with no sin to pay the penalty for my sin. And by trusting in Jesus as my personal Savior. That I instead of my sin have the righteousness of Christ. And it confuses us. But we accept it because that's what the Bible teaches. Can you think of any other passage, any, uh, not passage, but any other belief system that has a God that is absolutely holy and righteous and cannot stand sin in any shape or form? A God who is absolutely just and gives people exactly what is deserved. But a God who loves the people that all deserve to go to the lake of fire for all eternity. And all that we deserve is a one foot square in the lake of fire. This same God loves you so much that he became a part of his own creation. The Lord Jesus was born in this world. Lived an absolutely sinless life and went to the cross to pay the penalty for your sins and my sins. And it meets God's righteous requirement to the point where it, the scripture says in 1 John, it says that Jesus is the propitiation for our sin. That means satisfaction. God's thoughts aren't my thoughts. Because the gospel does not make sense to most people. And I understand that. But I understand it's the only way of salvation. And it's the only way that God can take a sinful people and allow them to have a relationship with Him. Because God's grace is God's grace and you can't earn it. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's not of works. Lest it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. My friend, maybe you're trying to work your way to heaven. I've got good news for you. By placing your trust in the finished work of Christ, by turning from your sin and turning from the life that you believe that you're earning your way to God in, by turning from that and turning to the Lord Jesus, your sins are forgiven. 
Today could be the day that you receive God's salvation. And the prophet talks about, to, to you and me, about uh, to surrender our thoughts. I've talked to a number of people who basically said salvation doesn't make sense. I've got to earn my way. I've got to work my way. I've got to do something. You've got to trust in Jesus as your Savior. And you know what happens when you do that? Your life changes. The Lord changes your heart. And I don't do good works to get to heaven, but I do them because he's changed my heart. And I'm already going to heaven. God says, your thoughts are not my thoughts. And in fact, he says, we need to submit to his word. There are times in life where I think we got to have something more. I got to have some kind of a shtick, some kind of a, a deal to draw people to Christ. But here's what the Bible says. I learned this my freshman year in Bible college, these verses. I had to memorize them. For as the rain comes down from heaven and the snow from heaven and do not return here, there, but water the earth and make forth it, and make it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God's word is kind of like the rain and the snow. Isn't this rain a blessing? God illustrated it for us, didn't he? By sending us beautiful, life-giving rain. Life is hard when you're going through a drought. I remember years and years ago, there was a terrible drought came through our area, and one of the farmers in our church mentioned that they had gotten, the, the crop adjuster went out, the insurance adjuster went out, and figured out that he was get it, getting a half a bushel of corn per acre. You know what that is? You can't even chop it for silage. It's that worthless. Listen, the rain is a blessing. The rain gives life. The nation of Israel. I um, uh, worked on a kibbutz in 1977 in the northern part of Israel. And I learned something about the ground in Israel. If you put water to that ground, it will grow anything. They had field corn, which they ate for sweet corn, which they didn't know what Iowa sweet corn like. They had alfalfa, they had grapes, they had olives, they had grapefruit, they had oranges, they had plums, and I mean, on just the one kibbutz I was in, and we found out that if you give water, that land will grow anything. You withhold water. It won't grow a thing. We like to complain about the water, the wetness from the sky, don't we? It's a cold rain today. I know that. But it's a blessed rain. In a couple weeks or months or a few days, there's going to be some stuff that come from the sky. It's white. It's cold. And I gotta admit, I love it. Okay, don't, don't, don't judge me. Please don't judge me. That snow is perhaps some of the best moisture our ground can get. Especially if it snows. We, we still remember sowing oats and getting a little dusting of snow on those oats and they would come up green as can be because it had that water that soaked right into the seed and into the ground. And you think uh, of all of the ideas on how to farm and how to farm better and how to get better crops and how to manipulate this crop and manipulate that crop and how to put the right fertilizer on, none of it works unless you have the water. And once you have moisture, and once you have water, you can grow things. And God is saying it is the same way with the Word of God. There are all kinds of plans people have to tell people how to get saved. There's sometimes what I call circus acts to try to get crowds and to fill churches. It is the Word of God that produces real fruit. 
It is the Word of God that we need to depend upon. It is the Word of God that will accomplish God's purpose. As you look at this, God says in verse 8, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. I began preaching. I was an assistant pastor in 1978. Whoa, that's been a couple day, days ago. <laughs> a few years ago. Now you know, and now you say, man, he is old. <laughs> you know what I've learned since 1978? I knew this before, but it's, it was hammered down to me in a greater way that we cannot replace the Word of God. We see the Word of God is a thing that will break the hard soul of people who reject Christ. There are times that the Bible's been under attack. I know that. There are people that will say, well, that, that's irrelevant for today. There are people that will try to rewrite the Bible. There are people that have developed their own translations of the Bible to, to, to um, uh, support their false doctrine. I understand that, but it comes down to this. The Bible stands, as the song says, like a rock undaunted amid the raging storms of time. This book, the Word of God, that's what's going to accomplish God's purpose in this world. And it may be that that same word, I, I think of those who have rejected the Word of God and today are in the lake of fire. That same word is echoing in their minds that they were shared. And there are times in life where I have some self-doubt. You know, you share the gospel with somebody and they don't respond. They don't trust in the Lord Jesus. And you always think, what could I have said better? I don't know if you've ever done that. How could I have shared this in a better way? How in the world could I do it in a more palatable way and they'd receive Jesus? And it comes down to this. I couldn't. That if I share the Word of God, I let the Word of God speak to people's hearts and lives and change their lives. And it only comes down to the Word of God. There's a great preacher in the 1800s by the name of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I've got a few of his books on my shelf. Someone asked Spurgeon once, how do you defend the Bible? And he said, defend the Bible? Defend the Word of God? That's like asking me, how do I defend a lion? I just let the lion loose and let him defend himself. Good advice, isn't it? The Lord will always fulfill His Word. If you want to have a fun study, and you can do this through the computer, through Google, type up, type in to your search engine, prophecies about Jesus fulfilled. What a neat study that is. There are, pro the Bible's full of prophecies. In fact, we're going to talk on Wednesday night about a prophecy that will yet be fulfilled about the Lord Jesus. But the Word of God tells me that God always fulfills His Word. The prophecies given are amazing and amazingly accurate. Jesus was born in, Na in Bethlehem. Fulfillment of prophecy. Born of a virgin. Fulfillment of prophecy. Raised in Nazareth. Fulfillment of prophecy. Fled to Egypt. Fulfillment of prophecy. Betrayed by a close friend. A fulfillment of prophecy. Buried and rose again the third day. A fulfillment of prophecy. Coming again to rule and reign on our, our earth. That's going to be a fulfillment of prophecy. And it could be very soon. 
God's word accomplishes what he will. And when that happens, this is all tied in here with Isaiah. When that takes place, I'm pushing the wrong buttons here. There we go. When that takes, I might preach a little longer if I don't have notes. We do have an extra hour, don't we? No, I'm sorry. When I submit to the mind of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ, when I submit to the word of God, God says there's a sweetness that will enter your life. It is unbelievable. It's exciting. Will you look at verse 12? He's talking about the millennial reign of Christ. We know that. He is writing to people that will be under the Babylonian captivity, will be crushed under the wheel of Babylon. And he says in verse 12, You shall go out with joy and be let out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Do you see the joy that Israel was going to experience during the millennial reign? There is an application to your life and my life. Because when I trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I step into His kingdom. I'm a part of His kingdom. And two things that are exciting about that kingdom is joy and peace. You can have joy in the Lord Jesus. Our world has happiness. They get a new car, they're happy. They wreck that new car, they're sad. <laughs> they get a new house, they're happy. They burn down that, old, that house, and they're sad. Or a tornado takes it. God gives an internal joy to those who are walking with Him. And circumstances are not always good. There are things that happen in life that break our heart. But we still have that joy. I've been told that there's a flag that flies outside Buckingham Palace. And that flag only goes up on the flagpole when the king, at that time when I read it, it was the queen, but now it's when the king is in their residence in Buckingham Palace. That that flag flies over Buckingham Palace says the king is here. I want you to know that joy is that flag in our lives. That when we express the joy that we have in the Lord Jesus, it's telling the world that the king is in residence right here and I'm flying my flag of joy. Tell you what, there's joy in serving Jesus. There's joy in following him. One of the benefits of knowing Jesus is joy. And the, another benefit is peace. We live in a world of turmoil. We live in a world where people can't get along. We live in a world that I just heard from a friend who lost a, another friend of over 50 years because he put the wrong thing out on social media about the wrong political candidate. And they will no longer be friends. <laughs> How tragic. But that's what life is like, isn't it? Life is filled with turmoil in our families, in our relationships, in our jobs, with our God. But my, war, my heart was at war deep within myself. I was in turmoil with my, within myself. I didn't have any peace. And then I placed my trust in Jesus. And one of the great benefits of knowing him is peace. Peace within myself. The world may persecute me. The world may drive me into the wilderness, but I can have peace in my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Benefits of salvation is joy and peace. And there is coming a day when nature that is groaning, Romans 8 says that the creation groans, awaiting its redemption. This passage says, the tree, the hills and the mountains are going to break forth into singing. 
I'm not sure if that's an anthropomorphism or if it will literally happen. But I know this. Song is a result of knowing Jesus. The trees of the field shall clap their hands. You see, creation is going to be restored to what God wanted it to be. And when the Lord Jesus reigns as absolute ruler of our world, even the earth is going to rejoice in the Lord Jesus. <sighs> that tells me I need to do the same. To find not only joy and peace, but celebration over my salvation. There ought to be some celebration in our lives when we think about serving the Lord Jesus and walking with Him and having a relationship with the living God. There ought to be celebration because, I'll tell you, I've had enough sad sack Christians around me. I don't want to be one of them. Man, there should be a celebration when we gather together to worship. It ought to be a celebration time. It ought to be a time when we celebrate our God. Because God takes the unfruitful things in our lives and makes them fruitful. The Lord talks about a couple plants that are going to be replaced in verse 13. Verse 13, it says, The thorns are going to be replaced, and the briar shall be replaced. If you don't know what a briar is, I can lift up my sleeves, and I can show you some scars from briars. I think we call them multiflora rose around here, um, where I've been opened up by them. Lots of hunting clothes ripped to shreds by them. There's not anything good that comes from a thorn bush. Not anything good that comes from a thistle. Not anything good that comes from a briar that I know of. And you realize in Genesis chapter 3 that God's curse on the land is why we have thistles and briars and thorn bushes. Do you see what God's going to do? And what God's in Israel and what God does in my life? Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree. The cypress tree is a, and I'm going to look up to make sure I get my notes right. The cypress tree is a tree that is not impervious to, but is a tree that does not easily rot. Many people use cypress because it will last for a long time. They are a long-lived tree. They are a, a tree that has, is an evergreen tree. And in, I did a little research, and a lot of the musical instruments in the Bible were made from the Middle Eastern Cypress because it doesn't change with the weather. Instead of the thorn, will be a cypress. Instead of the thistle, instead of the bramble, the briar, will be the myrtle tree. The myrtle is an evergreen tree as well. It's a type of a fir tree that is an aromatic fir tree. The Greeks saw it as a symbol of love. I like that. Maybe for our next anniversary I'll get you a myrtle tree. <laughs> but the myrtle tree has a smell about it that gives peace and blessing. Both trees are seen as shady trees. Both trees are seen as trees that give lumber. And here's what I believe God's saying here. God will take that which is unproductive during the millennium and he will make it something that is pleasant and productive. And God does the same thing in your life, in my life. When you trust in the Lord Jesus as your Savior, He takes that which is unproductive and fit for the fire. That's what thorns and briars are fit, that fit for, is to be burned up. Something that is basically does not produce fruit and brings no good. God takes that same thing 
and replaces it with that which is productive and a blessing to all who are around it. Salvation takes wasted lives and makes them profitable. And if I were to start telling stories, we'd be here, I'd get an extra hour to preach, huh? <laughs> We'd be here for an extra hour because I've seen life after life after life changed by Jesus Christ. I've seen lives that were unprofitable and worthless. Lives that people looked at and they said, that's sure a waste of oxygen. And I've seen God take those lives and I've seen God turn those lives around and make them a blessing to everybody around them. You see... Our salvation brings productivity into our lives as far as rejoicing in the Lord. And it's eternal. I love that last phrase. And it shall be to the Lord for a name. This morning I listened on YouTube before anybody came to church. There's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. Oh yes, it's mine. It shall be to the Lord for a name. God has a special name for you and I as an eternal covenant for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. One of the blessings of knowing the Lord Jesus is that God made an eternal promise to me. When I place my trust in the Lord Jesus the Lord Jesus says, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone pluck them from my Father's hand. My Father who gave them me is greater than all. No one could pluck them or from my hand. And my Father, which is greater than all, who gave them to me is greater than all. No one can pluck them from my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And here's the picture. When you trust in Jesus as your Savior, you have an eternal promise given you. When I placed my trust in Jesus, it's like the Father grabbed me in his hand and said, I've got you. I will never let you go. And the Lord Jesus does the same thing. And we've got a double bond, a double grip in our lives of an eternal covenant. You see, when I take God at his word, and I place my trust in the Lord Jesus as my Savior. And I realize that God's ways are not my ways. And I trust Him as my Savior. I have an eternal home, an eternal relationship with my Heavenly Father. Something I don't understand. That's why God's ways are higher than my ways. Why would God take someone who disrespected him with his words and with his thoughts and with his actions all his life? And when he trusted in Jesus, God would give me joy and peace and celebration and fruitfulness and an eternal relationship with him. But that's what you get when you trust in Jesus. Today, I want to encourage you that if you know Jesus, rejoice in Him. Celebrate in Him. When we meet at this table, I know it's a serious table, but see the celebration of our relationship with the living God as we go through life. Realize that my salvation is something to celebrate and be excited about. And if you haven't trusted him, I trust that today will be the day. Come talk to me. Talk to any of our church folk. We'd love to introduce you to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we think of the celebration that we have in our Savior. And we rejoice in that. We thank you that there's coming a day when the hills and the mountains are going to celebrate. They're going to break forth into song. The trees of the fields are going to clap their hands as Jesus rules our world for all eternity. Help us to have the same attitude, the same celebration in Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'd like to gather at the table right now and sing. Let's sing together 188 at the cross. At the cross. 
I'll make a couple of explanations. Let's stand together. Yeah, we'll stand together. And I'll have our, our deacons come as we sing 188. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. 188. and did my Savior bleed and did my Sovereign die would he devote that sacred head for such a one as I at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. You may be seated. Once a month we meet at this table to remember that Jesus gave his body for us to be tortured. He shed his blood for us to be saved. This does not impart grace. But it's something we take seriously when we realize that the price paid for your salvation and mine. And so I invite you, if you've got sin in your life, deal with it right here, right now. If you today, perhaps you're sitting, I need Jesus as my Savior today. Even right now as we pass these elements, you can be saved. And I invite you to draw close to the Savior. Recommit your life to Him during this time. I'd like to ask Brother Verve Davidson to lead us in prayer, remembering the body that was given for us. Yes, we do want to remember the body that was given for us. We thank you, Lord, for all that you went through just for us. We thank you now that we can remember that body. We can remember what you did. And realize that we need to trust in you. Yes, Father. For all that we do. And follow you the way you would want us to go. Lord, we pray now that as we accept this bread of life, remembering your body that you gave for us Amen. from the cross. Thank you, my Lord. Amen. Amen.
Word of God in Matthew 26 tells us that as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. I'd like to ask Brother Carol Colson to lead us in prayer, remembering the blood that was shed for us. Father, we continue this morning around your table. As already mentioned, we want to thank you. We want to thank you for the pain, mm -hmm. the anguish, and the brutality that you took willingly for each and every one of us. Cause us to be mindful of your love. Yes, Lord. Cause us to be attentive to your will for each and every one of our lives. May we be desirous to follow you in what you have for us each and every day. Cause us to have that desire to be drawn closer to you. We give you the praise and all the glory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen.